You all are going to love Ellie. Ellie Richter is such an amazing person. She's even more amazing than I expected. And I expected her to be pretty amazing. I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed connecting with her, talking with her. I love her perspective. Oh, she's just amazing. So the work she does is subconscious integrative therapy. So you'll have to check her out on Instagram. You can go to her website. It's Ellie, E-L-L-E-L-L-I, Richter, R-I-C-H-T-E-R.com. Of course, it'll be in the show notes, so you can just click. But I want you to be able to find her because she just does such incredible work in a way that it's integrative in a way that I haven't met a lot of people that can do this. She also wrote the book, or she co-wrote a book, WTF Human Design. So, you know, if you know me at all, you know I'm really interested in human design because human design really feels like a permission slip to just be you. I have found that, and it's more like an experiment. So you're taking this information and applying it to your life and helping you make decisions about things, but also how best to use your energy. But that's not even why I wanted to have Ellie on. I wanted to have Ellie on because she does a beautiful job about talking about trauma and trauma triggers in a way that you don't usually hear. And what am I always trying to bring you? A fresh perspective on health, healing, particularly around mental health. And at the very end, if you're a health practitioner, you got to hang on to the very end because I can't tell you the nuggets of gold that were left at the end of this session. So, so amazing. So make sure you listen all the way through because you don't want to miss any of the juicy parts, whether you're a health professional or not. But there is a part for health professionals at the end that I think you're really going to want to hear. Okay. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Ellie as much as I enjoyed talking with Ellie. Ellie, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. I'm so excited to be here. I absolutely love your vibe. You are one of the most positive people on Instagram. So when I'm feeling like shit on Instagram, (laughs) like if I start feeling really like down about it, I go over to your page, I feel better, and it's just lovely that your your light is really beautiful in the world. So I'm really excited for you to be here and share your light. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. You know, Instagram is such an interesting, it's such an interesting space. So thank you so much for being there and for feeling that way. Yeah. So I want to talk about a lot of things with you and I want to be mindful of our time. I'll try to to keep us on track, but we can go wherever we want because this is our show. We can do whatever we want. So, but I really wanted to have you on to talk a bit about trauma and what trauma responses, people might not be recognizing some of the responses that are actually trauma related, but I think it really helps if we start to talk about subconscious, like what do we mean about the subconscious why is it so important that we keep working with the subconscious even after you know decades of maybe other stuff we've tried? I love all those questions. So <laughs> first of all, trauma is a word that already holds a lot of associations. And most people associate with the word trauma, if physical traumas like accidents or war or stuff like that, and or the bigger T trauma, sexual assaults, uh, those types of things. So in my world, in the world of the subconscious, anything that we refer to as stressful, we consider a trauma. So the word stress and trauma are interchangeable in my world. So we can also just continue to talk about stress. And if you ask people, have you ever experienced stress in your life? Everybody would say yes. So everybody has experienced trauma or stress in their lives and to the subconscious mind let's back up a little bit there because we you know what is the difference so we actually have three minds so we have the super conscious or what you might refer to as the soul or intuition or god's voice or that deep inner knowing whatever we might name that inner knowing that small whisper let's just call it the super conscious in, in this kind of context. So the superconscious is the place that knows what's best for you. And that's really the place we wanna align the rest of our minds and our body and behaviors 
to being in alignment with the superconscious, being in alignment with your soul. So that's the whole like game, the outcome where we're headed. Now on the way there or it, it, to the side of the superconscious is also what's called the conscious mind and then the subconscious mind. Take a wild guess, Kelly, and you listening, how much of your thoughts do you think you're aware of in your day to day percentage wise? Yeah, less than 5%. Yes, very good. So you know that we have a conscious mind that is conscious and aware of the thoughts we think and the things we do and the feelings we have. And that part of it is only one to five percent. So it's a relatively small part. So I'm interested to help people with the subconscious piece, the 95 to 99 percent. And here's why. So the, they are very different minds. They're literally like apples and oranges. They learn differently. They are formed differently. And so the subconscious mind starts to form from the moment your soul enters your mother's womb. You become programmed. So let's say your mother was depressed or grieving while you were in utero. That creates an energetic imprint. So there's already what might some call generational trauma. So you're already imprinted with your mom's uh, energetic imprint and with your grandmother and sometimes previous generation. There are many interesting books called like The Body Keeps Score or It Didn't Start With You, where you can read about that so much of our personal stress experience is inherited right. and not through genetics, but through consciousness through epigenetics so that's the work by dr bruce lipton if you want to dive a little bit deeper into that so when we talk about stress or trauma we have to talk about the conscious and the subconscious and how they both deal with it so the subconscious mind say something stressful happens the subconscious mind is like a recording device it records every single detail from the smell in the air to uh, the way that the light was falling to the music that was playing on the radio to the feelings you had in your body to who and what was there now your conscious mind the one to five percent that you're aware of may not have recorded and noted any of those things but your subconscious did why is this relevant so let's say you experienced a stressful breakup and it was spring and birds were chirping and the sun was just in that perfect crisp temperature and you had that certain beverage that you always have in the spring and then your heart breaks. So then every spring or every time the weather is in a certain way or every time you drink that drink or every time that smells in the air, you're overcome with heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And then years go by and you may have no idea why and you may be in what we call a trauma response or a trigger you know and you will find yourself grabbing for things to make you control whatever you're feeling but what's really going on is an open trauma loop now for the subconscious mind you may not be aware of it because it's happening below awareness then you go into your conscious mind why am i feeling this way and your conscious mind loves to like abstractly think and logically think and then attaches meaning to why you're feeling this it must be my period it must be like i'm in the wrong relationship it must be like i don't like my job and so what we're learning, what I've been learning and doing this work for many, many years and with myself, we're never upset about what we think we are. A lot of times it's unresolved stress just being activated. Yes. And then the conscious mind just tells a story about it. Yes. But it's it's often some other reason. So mm -hmm. the conscious and the subconscious, they form differently and they learn differently. So um, I jumped around a little bit, but ultimately your programming starts in utero and then the first seven years of your life is mm -hmm. when your conscious mind forms. Mm -hmm. And then by age seven, our conscious mind begins to form. So they form at different times. By the time your conscious mind forms, your subconscious programs is already finished. Right. So you're basically programmed and you work a lot with parenting, you know, with children mm -hmm. so that's the time that our children really learn their beliefs their perceptions and their day-to-day -day emotional uh, right. responses so it's a really potent time so I hope this makes the conversation about trauma a little bit more accessible yes and why people can feel stress out of their skull even if they have no logical reason to you know I work with a lot of people mm -hmm. that have done all the therapy that on paper have an amazing life great relationship 
uh, great health or semi great health, great job, a lot of money, a lot of like on paper, the stuff, the success, but internally stressed, traumatized and in trauma responses. And I know that was another question, but I'm just going to let you comment. I know that was a lot. So <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And I think what resonates with me and if feel free to weave in your own experience, because your experience really resonates a lot with me. And I know I started in my early twenties, so I'm 53 now. So we're talking three full decades of truly working, like sincerely working on myself, like healing. I think that's why I went into psychology and mental health. Right. And I know you started early too, like 1920, I think when, and you can do a lot of healing and a lot of learning and still not really even be understanding the subconscious. And so that's why I think this is really important for people. And I just want, like, let it sink in a little bit. If this is feeling challenging for people, if they're like, oh, I don't know if I get it, maybe I get it. It's okay because we get it, it, it sinks in as you can digest it, right? And it takes a little while to be able to metabolize it. But I know for me, I thought I was working on the subconscious. I've been liking Bruce Lipton for what, 20 years now. I, you know, was all into the Course in Miracles and all the things. I thought I was doing it, Ellie. And I think I still, and it's just been this incredible journey of like continuing deeper and deeper understanding. And I thought when I was young, I was like, okay, we're going to get there. We're going to climb to the place of, I don't know, aligned with your soul and your healing and whatever I'm healed. I don't know what I thought. And what I've found is it's more like a deepening and widening. So I didn't know if you want to speak to that a little bit because it's exactly my experience personally and professionally, like people on paper, things look good. And I've been doing the work. I've been seeing the therapist and trying to eat whatever they think is healthy at the time and like all the things. And it's still like, you still are like, really? Mm -hmm. I still have this programming that's from the time I was seven is running the show. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you share that. And, and um, it can be so frustrating. We're in this really interesting time. I think that mm -hmm. people are so devoted to their personal growth and do a lot of conscious awareness but the subconscious doesn't change you know and so it's almost like a new I don't want to call it pathology but a new mental health issue where you know all the things but deep down things haven't changed and so people have known for a while that we need to reprogram the subconscious I just think you know how we do good marketing in this country but sometimes bad delivery mm -hmm. you know to me, this is like one of those things a lot of people say, subconscious reprogramming, but then there isn't actually that happening. And I don't want to throw anyone under the bus or suggest that we're not that powerful, that we can't change in an instant, because we are. And for most people, it's more gradual, and it really needs a key. So the key, there's a few keys that you can use to change your subconscious but a lot of things that promise that they do change the subconscious don't. So let me be really clear, those three minds, yep. to change the, the conscious mind, you listen to podcasts, you can read books, you go to therapy, you learn new language, you learn new techniques, and that's all conscious level. So awareness. Now, awareness brings us great relief when you can put the dots together like oh this is because of this thing that happened mm -hmm. there's relief now that's just on a conscious level it's not reprogramming the subconscious so right. awareness alone unfortunately doesn't reprogram the subconscious sometimes it does you know sometimes you have one of those moments where like you have an awareness you get a good cry and that changes your entire consciousness more often than not, it's not like that. And so these days, people, let's say you do some deep breath work or you have a plant medicine journey or you do some really great integrative therapy with somatic things and you have an emotional release that feels really profound, that may have likely not changed your subconscious. And that's what's so damn frustrating, right? So it doesn't mean that 
people are broken or that they're not doing enough. Sometimes it's really just using a different key. Now, the key that I use to help people change their subconscious mind is called Psych K, mm -hmm. P S Y slash K. And personally, I did a lot of experimentation before I came to Psych K because once I discovered it's a subconscious issue and I read all the Bruce Lipton work, I also realized the, the tools that I was using, thinking that I'm changing my subconscious aren't. I had also experimented with the Course in Miracles. I've done a lot of Law of Attraction work. I've done a lot of Joe Dispenza work. Yeah. And for me, that was, all of it like helped on some level, some level of my consciousness. It just wasn't hitting the deep stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once I started to experiment with Psyche, for me, that changed. And everyone is different. You know, everybody has a different journey. What I'm really passionate about is to help people understand you have to take ownership of everything in your life if you really want to mm -hmm. get there. <laughs> and yeah. I love that you're like, where do we, where do we get where to? Where are we getting? Like, where are we getting? So uh, alignment is also such an elusive word. All of these are elusive terms and there's expectations that we're creating. Now, it all depends on what you want. So, and then when you get really honest with yourself, for me, I want a really peaceful life where I feel safe and comfortable in my body, where I enjoy the relationships, where I enjoy what I'm doing day to day and where my body feels free. So when I get really honest with me, it comes down to certain feelings. You know, it's not the stuff or the numbers or the anything. It's a certain feeling that I want to create. So with that, I then take full responsibility of my creations. And since the subconscious makes 95 to 99% of your daily emotions, emotions, working on this part can also change the way you feel in day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Even the founder of Psyche, who's still alive, Rob Williams, or the gatekeeper, he is not happy all the time. It's not about that. You know, I think that if we look for eternal happiness, that is a place that doesn't involve being human you know being in the human experience so i believe that we're a soul having a human experience and not the other way around the human experience includes pain mm -hmm. so to me also the work includes embracing pain both physical mental and emotional and resourcing yourself and understanding how you can alchemize and be with pain and mm -hmm. understand it as part of the normal human experience. So part of this work is also unpacking and healing pain mm -hmm. and then also becoming resource so that you can, that come what may, as Eckhart Tolle would say, come what may, you're good with it. Whether that's painful or challenging, you know, that we can, that we feel resourced enough to handle it. And so with Psyche, we get into a whole brain state a state in which, yeah, go ahead. I want you to talk about Psyche, but I just want to really reiterate right here because I think it's really important that the body works on frequency and the subconscious doesn't speak English or German or any of the other languages that we try to, that consciously we are constantly trying to put language around things. And so we're really working with frequency. I really loved that you brought up emotion. Oh, you want to say something? It just does speak your language. Oh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, and, I, I, yeah. So when you work with the subconscious with Psyche, we do speak language and it does very much understand language. It's programmed in the language that you grew up with. So if we, if I grew up German, so yeah. I often work with myself in German, in German because my subconscious is German. Now, then every belief is a frequency. So that's okay. where that, connects, you know, so for example, I am love or I am enough has a higher frequency than I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> you know? So it, that's what emits the frequency that you embody. Okay. I think that's really important because I've been studying for years and didn't quite make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's the most powerful work I've done personally and professionally is really actually working on the beliefs. So even mm -hmm. in trauma work, we can sometimes there's a traumatic experience that the limbic system is still running and we can move that to the done file. And there are a lot of tools for that, which is great, but you're left with the beliefs mm -hmm. and the beliefs are the powerful part. So it seems to me 
that this, these are the keys, like this is, these are the keys that you're going to be sharing with us. So I want people to go grab a piece of paper if they're somewhere where they can do that. I know anybody can follow you and, and can work with you personally, but I just think this is so crucial for people to get that this is, we're working on a really deep level here yeah. and that you're working with the emotions. And I've said for years, the emotions are running the show. Mm-hmm. So do I have that right? Did I get that part yeah. right? Yes, okay. yes, and you get it all right. It's just, it's always, you know, when we try to explain these concepts, it, they are difficult to explain, difficult, mm-hmm. you know, because science is still kind of lagging behind it. I'm, true. Uh, you know, when you study neuroscience, for example, yeah. it, even Harvard teachers will tell you, well, if you are studying the brain, you want to understand what it does, but then there's also consciousness and consciousness is not in the brain. Mm-hmm. It's way beyond. So when we're working with the subconscious, we're really working with your entire consciousness. Okay. Now, from a I'm just going to talk just subconscious perspective. Okay. So let, let's say something stressful happened and yeah. let's say you were bullied and somebody told you when you were five or six that your nose is too big and that you stink. Now, the conscious mind later in therapy can dismiss that easily and say, well, that was just a kid being a kid. Now to the subconscious, that loop is still open. And with the right key, you can actually close that loop. So you can release the emotion completely and you don't have to relive it or put it in a file and it's still there. You can literally open the file, close it, and then it becomes wisdom. And that's what's so beautiful about transforming the perception around a stressful event with the right key. With Psyche, you can transform your perception and then it becomes wisdom. Okay. Then the next step, as you mentioned so wisely, uh, it's not just what happened, but the beliefs that form as a result. And especially if if the stressful event like divorce or being bullied or a death or a move happened early on, then it's usually the beliefs that form are very negative. Yeah. I'm not good enough. It's all my fault. I am bad fundamentally. I'm unlovable. I'm not safe. And so these are beliefs that most people are not aware of that they have these beliefs. And because consciously we can logically talk ourselves out of these fears and programs. Right. And we can say, well, I'm a good person. I pay my taxes. I don't lie. I don't steal, whatever. Like we, we have these like, and, or you have a conscious mind that picks you apart and it's like, no, 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 I am a bad person. And here's why, right. you know, so depends, but it doesn't actually matter. Conscious mind and subconscious can be on completely different pages. Mm-hmm. So it's really important to be very open and curious because most people operate on shitty beliefs right. and are consciously not aware. Then some people that have done a lot of work, they are aware that they're operating on shitty beliefs and don't know how to change them. So affirmations only work when you already believe it. If you try to affirm something that you don't actually believe, it's it's almost like bullshitting yourself and it causes more inner conflict and more dissonance. Yes. You know, so in in Psyche or a good technology, you know, regardless of what technology you're going to end up using to change your subconscious, you can change these beliefs easily. So that's when I work with people with trauma, we close the loop of the event that happened. Yeah. And we change the negative beliefs that formed as a result of that. Exactly. Okay. Love it. I'm glad we went just a little deeper. So now let's talk about the key or any keys, but let's start, let's just talk about Mm Psyche. So Psyche has been around for 33 years Mm -hmm. and Bruce Lipton is best friends with Rob Williams that, you know, gave that. And it's a beautiful technology that you can use to help yourself make positive changes to your subconscious. I was a coach and I had been working with neuroscience and holistic things and, you know, all the somatic things, my background is in physical therapy and health education, some psychology. So I studied all the things, right. <laughs> of course, and there was all the things that I mentioned. And I was like, man, I'm bumping up against the subconscious piece. My beliefs are shit. I'm still on open trauma loops and like WTF, you know, and uh, through the work 
by Dr. Bruce Lipton, I found Psyche, and to me, it was the fastest and most effective way. Now, other keys that you can use, hypnosis is still a, a very well-known tool. My um, What I prefer in Psyche is that you're not in, in a, um, what's the word? You're still conscious, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you're not in a hypnotic state. You're very much making the decision. So it's a little bit more direct, you know? Mm -hmm. We can directly decide this is the belief that I want to choose. Right. And I like the self-empowering piece of that and the personal responsibility. Both are really wonderful keys. Another thing that you could use to work with uh, trauma is EMDR. Yep. And I have a couple of EMDR therapists that are my clients and they tell me like one trauma might take 90 minutes with EMDR with Psyche, it's about five minutes. So just as a efficiency thing amazing in german i like the efficient thing however everyone resonates with different keys the bottom line is that i'm excited about just sharing is that we have new technologies these days right and we need to understand the power of the subconscious and that it learns and changes differently than the conscious and so you can do all the conscious work and still be in the same patterns that doesn't mean you're broken it doesn't mean that you suck or your therapist sucks. It just simply means there's a missing key, you right. know? Yes, for sure. Yeah. And I'm studying, I'm EMDR trained, brain-based hypnotherapy trained. Ellie, we're, you're, you know, like I've done all the things too. Haven't trained in Psyche, which is interesting, but right. I do really love there's certain, I like havening. There's a havening technique is one of my favorite, but I like fast and efficient myself. I don't know if I'm German or not, but I'm not, I don't know. I don't think so. But, but I think it's like, I, I agree because energetically it doesn't have to take a really long time to have a profound experience of healing. So I love that. I know Psyche is a little hard to explain to people, but I thought we could unpack it at least a little bit if people are curious about working with you and they're like okay what is this actually what what would a session look like well let's use you as an example so like what are you bumping up against right now I have noticed okay I'm like okay let's I have <laughs> noticed and this is literally this weekend I just noticed this I, I'm trying to explain exactly how it is because it's bet easier if I explain how my oldest son used to be so excited about something. And then it would be time to do it like Disney, like we're going to Disney, he's so excited. And then we get there and he literally starts backing up. And like mm. the fear you can see, like white water rafting, so excited, get to the edge of the river and he literally starts backing up. And I noticed this in myself recently with work. I get mm. so excited. I know exactly what I wanna do. I start moving in the direction of it. And there's something that's, there's an, there's a belief, right? I'm like, oh, I'm rubbing up against a subconscious belief here that is fear-based. Um, it's almost always fear-based with, I don't know, with everybody, but with me. And I'm like, what is this that literally I feel like, oh no, never mind. I uh, maybe it's the wrong direction. It's cutting other people. I'd start all this. The the conscious mind will then start the loop. You know the loop. Okay. Okay, so if you were my client, I would thank you for sharing. And I would be like, well, what do you want to be able to do instead? So if you could wave a magic wand, what would you like to be able to do instead? I really love the ease and the, the feeling the ease and the flow in my work. That's what I really love. Feeling really mm -hmm. good. I feel good in my body, but that ease and the flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now... Since you have discovered, okay, there's something stopping me, something holding me back, and you already have awareness, it must be a belief, you know, because typically all our pattern and our behavior is 95 to 99% driven by the subconscious programs. And of a lot of times these fears are not logical. So let's, I would first ask you to be really open and curious. Right. Okay. And you can answer this first instinct from your body. If you were to truly allow yourself to be in a state of ease and flow with your work, and when the idea strikes you and you get passionate and you want to do it and you go ahead and do it and imagine really letting yourself be in that ease and flow, what are you afraid of? Not being taken seriously. 
Okay. Like I can feel it right in my throat. Not being taken seriously. Yeah. And what the what's the worst that would happen then if you were to not be taken seriously? I, what popped in my head is like to be wrong. Like mm -hmm. then I would just be wrong. Like mm -hmm. people would not like me and then I would be, yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so you're bumping up against the fear of making a mistake, fear yeah. of rejection, you fear of abandonment, very, very common. Yeah. So then if we were to be in session, I would ask you, do you want to move through the fear directly or do you want to make a new belief statement? Now, a new belief statement that could be supportive, for example, would be, it's okay for me to make mistakes. You know, mm -hmm. so I work with a lot of high achieving people and I'm one myself. And the fear of making mistakes is a really big procrastination reason. And so we will always make mistakes. That's right. part of life. So then the permission and the belief it's safe for me to make mistakes or it's okay for me to make mistakes is amazing for people and typically helps people to move through the fear of making mistakes. Or you could work with the fear directly. And since the body doesn't know the difference between real and imagined, right. you would take yourself through the process of imagining you pull through with your idea and then people don't take you seriously. You end up making a mistake and you end up being wrong and no one would like you and like your worst case scenario until you feel complete peace and non-attachment around it and come what may, you're good with it again, you know? So then we would apply the psyche processes, which are brain balancing exercises that take about five minutes to help you either move through the fear or build the new belief. And we're communicating with muscle testing in psyche. So we always get the confirmation via the muscle test, whether or not the process is complete and whether or not the belief changes have happened. So another thing I love about it is you have like direct uh, confirmation that the process has worked. Okay. Then we would through, let's say, would you, and I'm gonna, let me ask you this, would you intuitively rather move through the fear or would you intuitively rather like to make the belief change? The first, I think work through the fear. Mm -hmm. So then let's just say you and I just work through the fear and you're mm -hmm. on the other side of this and you're already feeling so much relief. And in working through the fear, you may have gotten some insight that this had to do with an experience in school where your teacher called you out on something and you felt stupid mm -hmm. and you might have the underlying limiting belief, I'm stupid, right. yeah? And then we would work with that and you're like, I am smart enough, I am capable, you know? And so just kind of peel the onion until I would eventually ask you now, if you imagine yourself being at ease and flow at work, what are you afraid of? And you'd be like, nothing, I'm ready, I'm in the ease and flow. So that's kind of like how a session would go. Okay. And very targeted. Usually it's very easy. You know, I have a lot of experience in spiritual surgery. So we kind of get to the, the good parts quickly, you know, especially if you're really open and curious, because a lot of it isn't logical. You know, you could talk yourself logically out of it. You'll be like, I'm highly educated. I got this. There's no reason for me to stop myself. And a lot of people call it imposter syndrome and whatever we might call it. And just what is that really a set of negative beliefs? Yeah. That's, that are causing your system to be so dysregulated yeah. that you then don't have the bandwidth to execute. Right. That's exactly right. That's what it is. And I think I, what I love about going directly with, like working with the fear and going into the belief is the layering, the onions. So I'm guessing whichever way I had decided, you're still working on the layers. It's just in a different and a different handle or I don't know another way of saying that yeah so for some people you know I have a lot of people that I work with with anxiety and yeah. there's always a reason that our system is dysregulated you know anxiety just doesn't come over you for nothing right. it is usually coming from within either a trauma that's being triggered like I mentioned earlier you know if you had a stressful event right it, one small detail that's associated with the stress event can cause you to have a full-blown panic attack right. for seemingly no reason, right? And so in your case, with this block that you're bumping up against, there's a reason, you know, and we will find the reason by moving forward. So that's what I love. Like, instead of looking backwards and finding the reason, 
you tell me what you want instead and we work towards the solution and by doing so you'll discover why you were blocked in the first place right and the layers of questions I'll, I'll basically keep asking you do you feel ready to be at ease and flow and you're like mm, there's something else you know and then uh -huh. mm, there's something else until we clear it fully and for some for, for certain issues health issues for example there are small layers and then there's a, a term called hidden benefits I oh yeah we should talk about hidden benefits <laughs> talk about hidden benefits <laughs> Hidden benefits is like when there's actually a gain from the things that we say we don't want to do anymore. So maybe you're gaining uh, a break or maybe you're gaining more connection to your son or more, right. maybe you're gaining safety from holding back like that, you know? So we right. could kind of, and especially when I work with really intelligent, high achieving people that have learned a lot, there's often hidden benefits because we can be sneaky in the way that we get our needs met. And a hidden benefit really just means that you're benefiting from whatever the thing is that you say you don't want to do anymore or that you want to change. Mm -hmm. And none of this means anything bad about us. It just simply means, hey, there's a benefit of this pattern that I consciously say I want to let go of. You know, some mm -hmm. wet drinking, for example, there can mm -hmm. be many hidden benefits of holding on to alcohol or sugar or stuff like that where people want to make a lasting change and then just have a hard time. So we just look at the hidden benefits. I know. I love to look at the hidden benefits, but even what I love about having a key, having tools, having technology is that, you know, you can go round and round in your brain about this consciously and never quite get at it and never quite, and not change anything. Yeah. So yes. I think, yeah, that's, I've been talking about hidden benefits for years and years and years. And it's, it makes sense, right? You're like, oh yeah, yeah. But then if nothing changes, nothing changes. And that's really frustrating for people. So. And it, it's also really helpful to be witnessed, you know, to have a mirror. I'm all for self-healing and we are only as aware of as our blind spots, you know, and typically when we hit shame, which is like the predominant reason that we're stuck or overwhelmed, when we hit shame, we stop with self-awareness because it's just too painful mm -hmm. to look at, you know, mm -hmm. and then having a safe, loving, compassionate container, whatever that looks like can mm -hmm. be helpful to be witnessed and mirrored and for somebody to help us see what we don't see. And most of it is that mountain of shame, you know? So to me, shame is the result of beliefs and experience that made you feel less than or better than, you know, disconnected. Whenever something happened that made you feel separate from the rest of the world, and that can happen in utero, in the first couple of years or later on in your life. And then beliefs form like I'm too different, I can't connect, or I'm better than, or I'm less than those types of beliefs and they cause shame for sure. Yeah. I even studied shame for a very long time too, Ellie. And I, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I know it's great. It's so funny, right? It's funny in a not ha ha way. But one of mm -hmm. the things that I've noticed too, is that we can vacillate between feeling not enough and more than. So even the same underlying issue or belief is swinging us Yes. In both directions, which can be really confusing Very. for people, you yes. know, and that's, I think, yeah, that, that, yeah. That's about all I want to say about that, I think. Yeah. The big, the big mission of psyche is really to help heal the illusion of separation. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, and, and to help you align with the principles of nature, which is diversity, adaptation, you know, there is so much diversity in the world. And in our experience as a human and in our emotional landscape is so much diversity. So when we look at the principles of nature, uh, where everything we need to know is modeled for us, and then we align ourselves with those principles and we, we heal from the illusion of separation, a different experience of life is possible. But Bruce Lipton calls it heaven on earth, you know, yeah. and right. whatever you want to call it to me, I want to be really intentional that it doesn't mean happiness all the time, but it means you're yeah. empowered. That's a different sensation. You know, you're empowered and you know how to leverage your human experience and you know how to support yourself when there's times that you're struggling, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We're not just talking about just being happy all the time. It's not, it's not about that at all. I love, I really do love the illusion of separation. I don't love the illusion of separation. I love <laughs> the, yes. the healing, the, the healing from that illusion of separation. And all of my work these days is about harmonizing with your natural environment, with nature, taking our cues from nature. So I love all of that seems right up my alley, exactly where I'm moving on my my path, my journey. So you've just had so many really important things. Like we're all on our own healing journey and everybody has to find what resonates with them. And the subconscious is really running 95 to 99 percent. So it's really important to work with that. I do want to just circle back really quickly to see if there's anything else you want to say about trauma responses. Like some of the things that we do I too, I'm a, I've always, I love when I don't love, I keep saying the word love. I'm just loving you. I'm loving this conversation, <laughs> but I've always thought it was really interesting when people, colleagues would come to me and say, can you help with this client or what? And I say, well, what's their trauma history? And they say, oh, no trauma. And you want to laugh. These are people in the field, Ellie, that yeah. it's, we're talking about stressors. It doesn't have to be the big T traumas. In fact, often it can be the smaller T things that you overlooked that you just, or you're like, oh, well, that was life. It is part of being human. And we're saying we're not supposed to be happy all the time, but we can be harmonized, integrated. We can be okay with the life on life's terms, however you want to say that. But I do want to just give you some space to talk about the trauma responses that people may not be like, oh, wow, yeah. that really is a stressor for me. You know, I think because we associate originally with the term trauma, something else, you know, I think that's why some quote unquote professionals don't necessarily associate. It. And a lot of people that have unresolved stressors, let's just say stressors. Yeah, let's say stressors. You know, don't have a very good memory of their childhood. And that's part of what's part of the challenge. So a lot of people don't have a very good memory and typically have filed away their childhood as good, you know, or healthy because they have a semi-decent relationship with their parent and they don't feel like being a victim. The other thing in the trauma world is this idea that if you experience trauma, that makes you a victim. So let's just push, put all this aside and let's just talk about reality presenting itself. You know, if you, for example, have a hard time being present, and you can't be without your phone or without stimulation at all, then I would say you're living with unresolved stress. Yeah, so if you're always swiping and you're in the bathroom, you're driving, and there's there's always a phone in your palm, and or when you have a day of nothing to do on your schedule, initially you want it, but when it's there, you don't know what to do with it. You have a hard time relaxing, hard time really resting. And even if you are doing nothing, if your brain is going a million times an hour, you're living with unresolved stress. Unresolved stress or the way that we respond to it, so what's called a trauma response, can literally be anything. It can be stuff that we think is healthy. So if, if you're exercising every day, and you you have a hard time not doing that and feel guilty and ashamed when you don't do it, you're probably living with unresolved stress and exercises probably become a trauma response, not necessarily an act of self-love. Being very successful work-wise, making a shit ton of money, being the first one in the office and the last one to leave can also be a trauma response. So a lot of what, what is a considered a stress response, some people might think it's personality or being really funny, you know, deflecting everything, being always that happy-go-lucky optimistic person that can also be a way that you're responding to unresolved stress. So almost anything that we consider can can have an origin in stress. Right. Now, on, there's a spectrum. On the one end, we have completely out of control. And I think that's easier for people to see as a trauma response or stress response. Let's say you do a lot of drugs and lose everything and you end up on the street. Yeah. That can be a response to unresolved stress that maybe is easier for the human eye to 
connect the dots, hey, that person has probably been through a lot and has some pain to lead you there. The out of controlness, you know, out of control emotional behavior, out of control relational behavior, we can easily say that's probably a trauma response. The other end of the spectrum, which I think is a lot more common in this country, is the being hyper in control. Hyper in control, even to the point of your health. I meet a lot of people who eat a certain way. Yes. And live a certain way, very non-toxic, and but it's all driven by fear and shame. Yeah. So it's all, I, I consider it still a stress response because if you're out of a stress response, you're relaxed. Yeah. You're present, you're safe, you're in the window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. You can address conflict easily. You yeah. can handle feedback and criticism with curiosity. You are able to choose your words, able to be present, able to show up to your relationships, to your work, but you also know when to take care of yourself. You, you know, so there are certain parameters to me that show that your that your stress is mostly resolved. Right. You know, and it's kind of like this idea of living inside of the window, window. of tolerance. I love you know? the window of tolerance. So, yeah, yeah, if you're outside of the window, we have fight flight on the one end, yeah. where you just kind of like easily run away or get into conflict, or the freeze, where you're just kind of like, oh, the end the headlights, you do nothing, you avoid conflict. Yeah. In clinical terms, anxiety over here, fight flight. And freeze would be depression, you know, but ultimately we throw these words around so quickly. They really just relate a, a state of the nervous system. Then when you're living with chronic stress for a really long time, your nervous system will go into flooding, fawning or fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you basically uh, just go along with anything or you cry at the drop of a head or you're extremely exhausted. So those are all symptoms of being living with accumulated trauma or stress. And then think about how do you respond to that? Right. So ask yourself right now, maybe journal about it. How do you respond when your nervous system feels agitated? Or how do you respond when your nervous system is exhausted? Or when you're crying all the time? Or when you're um, avoiding conflict? Because then you're like, well, I start to smoke. Or I start to watch Netflix. Or I start to eat. Or I start to dive deeper into work. Or I start to overthink. These are your quote unquote responses to your tr trauma responses. So your this is what we refer to. Right. And so if you understand originally, it starts with a discomfort in the nervous system, fight, flight, freeze. And then how do you react when you're in these stages? Then you're like, oh, okay. So I tend to overeat. Then you know mm -hmm. overeating and dieting is your trauma response. Right. Or maybe you spend money, then spending money is your trauma response. Right. Or money struggles is your trauma response. And some trauma responses look pretty. That's when people have a hard time healing the trauma response because they're afraid that if they weren't driven by pain and suffering and trauma that they would get fat, lazy, and never do anything ever again. Right. Which That's we could spend better. like two hours mm -hmm. talking about that because it's huge. But I just wanted, and this is something that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. So when I find another kindred soul, I'm like, yeah, this is really what people talk about the trauma responses, but not why it's so hard to heal. Not why, why, of course we wouldn't want to, because then we have the belief that if we stop, we're going to get fat, lazy and broke or whatever. Yeah, basically uh, that happens a lot, you know, and it's really easy to spot when you know what you're looking for. Yeah, and right. so typically, um, yeah, once people understand that loving yourself and being at peace with yourself and safe actually gets you further, then they're willing to let go of the trauma, you know? And so there's always a way, there's always a way. And you can, if you take full responsibility for your life, moving forward, now moving forward, there's such a beautiful way. And we're never victim to the past and we're not victim to our genetics and we're not certainly victim to trauma. There's new technologies that we have available these days. And just like in your case with your little bump that you're bumping up this belief, yeah. you know, this would be easy to solve. And then off you go. You know, the last yeah. option of why things aren't happening is sometimes we simply don't want it as badly as we think we do. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that happens too, but very rarely. A lot of times it's usually 
that there, that we do these things not because we are lazy or don't have enough willpower and we don't it's not that we are we are self sabotaging because we're broken or flawed or we're enjoying self sabotage it's usually that there is a conflict between your conscious desires and your subconscious programs and with this work you can resolve the conflict so that you're aligned with your superconscious so you can trust and follow your intuition and be in that alignment or that flow that is right for you right heal the illusion of separation Right. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, I have two more quick things. I want to just find out what nourishes your body, mind, soul, because I know it's a lot of things and you're very open about what is nourishing to you. So I wanted to ask that. Well, the number one thing that nourishes me is a long time. And that took me most of my life to figure out, you know, I used to be a smoker in Germany mm -hmm. And then I dabbled with other things to numb myself. And what it came down to when I let go of those behaviors, I realized that my number one thing is I recharge by being by myself. And so, yeah, that's what I like to do to nourish myself. And for a while, I was afraid, is this a trauma response? Because sometimes as a trauma response, people self-isolate and feel a lot better on their own. And I dove into that to know it's actually how I recharge. So that's one of the things. The other thing is nature. Um, being outside, I have a wonderful grass in my yard. And so just laying in the grass, amazing. Um, aligning myself with the rhythms of nature in general has been a really big thing. And then, of course, I use Psyche with myself and yeah. Whenever I notice myself um, making up stories or making assumptions or taking, making things mean about myself that they don't mean, um, my community, my friends, my relationships, I think community is a really big aspect. And then my relationship to source, you know, yeah. and that, can, that I cultivate with little rituals, meditation and, you know, bath and somatic exercise but it doesn't take much for me to nourish me because I made it now my primary default so I don't do a lot of things that take me out of that whereas I used to do a lot of things like overworked myself to a gazillion that was a lot big trauma response so I would have to constantly nourish myself with a lot of activities that counter that now I basically stopped working so much, <laughs> you know, so like I aligned my lifestyle in a way that mm -hmm. there isn't so much that I need to balance, if that makes sense, you know, so right. I gave it an overall makeover again and again and again, and I, I keep doing that, you know, so I keep really being honest with myself, how do I really want to live and what's really important and I'm very like service oriented, so what makes me happiest is to be of service and it's actually what nourishes me the most, but besides a long time and being with my community is being of service. So I'll make sure that there's a good balance with that. But then, of course, there's all the things from healthy eating to moving my body. However, to me, nothing nourishes me more than a long time. I love that. Um, what about yeah, you? Yeah, same. Uh, very similar. Um, but what I love that you're also bringing up, because I do think it's helpful for health practitioners to hear. I mean, we all are into self-care because we tend to be in, we like to serve and that, that nourishes our souls to serve. But if you don't really, it's not this, it's never done. Like this process of revisiting how you want to live your life. But I think you and I both served people for a long time without even understanding subconscious healing. So I just want to point that out. I don't know if you have anything else to share with the health professionals that might be listening. You can add that. Well, I don't know if this is helpful at all, but before I came to subconscious work, self-care was almost like a full-time job for me. Right. You know, I would serve, have, a, have my sessions in the day and would be so depleted at the end of the day. Yeah. It wasn't just that I didn't have energetic boundaries, but I simply didn't have the subconscious programs to uh, support myself in the work that I was doing. Yeah. You know, I was working up, I, I was 
working with a lot of unresolved trauma and negative beliefs, I was basically willpowering my way through imposter syndrome all the time. Yes. You know, when you work with people that have experienced trauma and limiting beliefs, it's not always rainbow and butterflies, not just in the witnessing, but sometimes there can be conflict or projecting onto the practitioner where you have to be in a whole brain state and just hold space for the person. So in a lot of ways, before subconscious work, I wasn't fully resourced, you know. So at the end of my week, I was wiped and I would do so much to 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 feel good, you know. And I wasn't able to turn it off. Like in so many ways, in hindsight, I'm like, wow, I don't know how I did it, period. And so I work with a lot of coaches and practitioners and wellness practitioners and therapists to help them find their identity outside of you know work. What's really going on is a lot of times when you are so devoted to something, you will attach your worth to it. And that happens to a lot of men. Men, when they lose their job or their financial situation changes, their self-worth goes down in the shitter. And that's now also happening for women since we've been more empowered in the workspace. So now we are also unconsciously attaching our worth and our lovability to our ability to serve. So then when we're not serving, it's kind of like, who am I? And I'm not good enough and I'm worthless and blah, blah, blah. You know, like always relating through that role versus like, Again, closing that illusion of separation, just knowing you are the same wherever you go, whether you're serving or you're in community or you're with your partner or whatever, you're you're lovable, safe, good enough, worthy wherever you go. And so to let go of this identification with your work is really, really important for people that are of service and male, female or whatever gender you're choosing. It's really, really important to understand that we're not our jobs. And that, was, that made a big change for me. I knew that I'm not my job consciously, but my subconscious was definitely, my worth was wrapped up into how much I work, how productive I am and how much I serve. Changing that and untying that from each other gave me a lot of peace and freedom. And I just get to be me no matter what role I am in. Um, yeah. And I don't know if that helps for you or anybody listening that's in that position. I do. I think it really does help because there is such freedom in that process. So I do think that that will be helpful. And the last little thing, music is also something that nourishes my soul. And I saw that you saw Xavier Rudd and I adore Xavier Rudd's work. He, I mean, he's just what a beautiful soul. Follow the Sun is probably one of my favorite songs. So I just noticed that you had been there and I thought that was really incredible because I don't know anybody else that has been. Yeah, you know, he's, he's, it's interesting. I got into his music in almost 11 years ago when I wanted to travel the world. And then my dad fell ill and I traveled the world in different ways with him. Much more internal world we traveled, but mm -hmm. the Follow Your Sun was my anthem for that time, you know, uh -huh. and a lot of emotional meaning and music is so fascinating and creativity. You know, when you really think about we're spiritual being in this human experience, well, the ultimate creators and expressing creativity is why we're here. And it's not just in the form of music or what we define to be art, but even your work is a creative expression. So you are basically creatively blocked right now because of some fears, you know, but ultimately like, it's the ultimately why are we here to express ourselves creatively and it's not just in the typical means that we know that art is everything we do from the way you dress to the way you eat to the way you design your life your house your day it's all a creative expression so you know creativity i think is the most important frequency and is you know what we all want to do and, and express because it's healing humanity and the planet. Beautiful. I mean, what a beautiful gem to drop right at the end here. I could talk to you forever, Ellie, because we didn't even get to talk about WTF human design, which I will make sure I put in the intro, because um, I also love human design and think that's amazing. What is yours? Oh, I'm a six, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm a six, two generator. Of course. Well, yeah. Then that would be a question I would have asked you when you were describing the 
the challenges we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the six line, just a little nugget for you, Kelly. Yes. Six lines tend to be struggling with the fear of making mistakes because there's a, the high integrity of a six line. Mm-hmm. So every six line that I've ever worked with, including myself, we need to know that it's safe and okay to make mistakes. Right. And we need to know mm-hmm. it not just here, but in every cell of our being, because the fear of making a mistake is really real when you're in it. Right. Um, yeah. So just, you know, just so you know, you're not alone. <laughs> and if you know your human design and you happen to carry a six line, perfectionism is a tendency and a trauma response for a lot of six lines. Right. What is your human design? I'm a six, three manifester. Oh, fun. I I had a feeling you were a manifester. That does not surprise me. Uh, Very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to have you back on the show because there's so much more to unpack. And I'm so grateful for your time. I know everyone will come come find you and will want to do work with you because you're amazing. Your light is so bright and beautiful. Thank you so much. Same. It's like, you're wonderful. And I so love the work that you're doing. I'm so grateful that you're doing it. And um, I hope that you feel inspired to move through the fear of mistakes and do it anyways. And if you struggle, you know, you know what keys you can use. And that to me, like knowledge is so empowering when you understand, oh, there's other keys and maybe it's just the key that didn't fit, not me. You know, so often I think, at least for me, I don't know how it was for you, but you start to think there's something wrong with you when you Mm -hmm. try to things you know especially in times of the internet now someone shares their success story they look fantastic and you're like oh shit I'll do that then you do that and then it's not yielding the same results and one might start to believe what's wrong with me maybe it's hopeless for me maybe I have some uncurable mental disease and we go down the rabbit hole of victimization pathologization when really it's often the conflict between conscious and subconscious we're bumping up against. Absolutely. And I really appreciate you using me as an example. I know, I mean, I know exactly where, where I'm going with this. And I I have absolutely no doubt that that's what's going on. And that it's so amazing that we have technologies, we have, we have keys, such a good, really good point that you make. So we're infinite, there's infinite potential in each of us. And The living out your potential, I think, can put some pressure on. But personally, when I get really honest with myself, mm-hmm. I just crave peace. You know, and I imagine you just crave joy. Being a generator, joy is your jam. Bliss, joy. For me as a manifester, it's peace, you know. So when I get honest, what does a peaceful life look like? And then I'm creating this. When you get honest, what does a joyful, blissful life look? Then you're creating that. So I think we need to move away from this idea that it's all outward oriented and like in the stuff, you know, I think true success starts on the inside. And if you then like a big house or big bank account or be on stages and that's what lights you up beautiful and ultimately success really is an inner feeling of contentment of fulfillment of peace and then whatever you want to create on the outside that's to me like living your potential or your alignment you know beautiful and what I found is you can't follow another's path you can be inspired Right. But you've, you've said this too, which is why I like human design because it really is a permission slip to yeah. really just be you. Kelly, you're wonderful. I'm so grateful for you're the opportunity amazing. to talk about all the things that we love. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Anybody that tuned in. Absolutely. Thank you, Ellie.